Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to Freshwater Ministries. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. My wife is out right now picking up uh, our granddaughter. She should be back shortly. Hallelujah. And I'm trying to get this thing to stop doing whatever it's doing. Computer's acting up. God is good. Amen. Amen. I'm excited to have you here. Welcome to Power in Discovery. Uh, Freshwater Ministries. Uh, we're just we're just excited what God is doing, what He's always been doing, and that is just feeding us His Word. Amen. So I'm going to ask uh, Minister Edwin to uh, pray us in. Amen. Lord God Almighty, we thank you. We praise, we glorify your name. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here tonight to be taught by you. Teach us, O Lord. Give us knowledge and understanding as we read your word. Open the scriptures up to us. We thank you, Lord, for that. Lord, I want to lift up a brother, O Lord, who's in the hospital. We pray for healing right now in Jesus' name. Healing from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Let your will be done in this situation, O Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are the great physician. We pray, O Lord, for all those who are in pain and suffering, for their healings too. Yes, Lord. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Jesus we name. pray, O Lord, that these this time of discovery, O Lord, touches people's hearts and that they discover you. Yes, in Lord. Jesus' name, let us discover you on every page. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I uh, I'm excited about tonight. I've um, been busy all day and all week. So keep me in prayer. Um, you know, just a lot of things on my plate. And God is good, and He's always first in my, in my on my plate. I mean, I eat from His servings. I I, I love the Lord, and you know we always don't think we pray enough. We don't think we you know read enough. We don't study enough. If you're sold out to God, I think that's how we always feel that we can always search for Him more deeply and to get greater understanding of who He is, and so. Um, tonight we're going to be in, in Isaiah 43. Uh, we're not going to James tonight. We're going back. Uh, we're, go we're going to Isaiah. Uh, I just found James. Too. I, I wanted to go to James, but uh, I really felt led to, to go a different direction. So I give God all the glory because it's, mm -hmm. it's his word, not mine. Mm -hmm. He makes the choices. I was in Isaiah. <laughs> Looking for James. So I, I uh, Isaiah what? Forty-three. I get things situated here. Um, hallelujah. In Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, there's only fifty prophecies that have been fulfilled. In the book of throughout Isaiah, and and, and I, that's that's notable and truthful, and can be proven and revealed. But tonight, I want to just talk about God loving us. God loving us. He is our redeemer. He he is our salvation. He is the one who restored us from our lost state of mind. And we are to trust and believe in him. If you, if you will believe, if thou can believe, all things are possible through Christ Jesus. If we will take time to understand that, that God always has a purpose for us. We were formed. He knew us before we were formed by mothers. When he, he called us forth. He, he, he gave us a name. He named us. He, he made it possible that we could Come to him. He gave us a pathway that he that we could be redeemed, that we could walk on, that we could that we that we could gain righteousness because of our sinful nature and our fallen nature. He knew we were going to fall, and so he he preordained himself 
to be the sacrifice for us. Amen. Amen. So now we're going to start reading here right from chapter, verse 1, I mean. Amen. So we're in Isaiah 43. Okay, Isaiah 43, uh, verse 1. Now, and I'm reading now the NASB. You may be reading now the King James or the NLT or that's King James. Um, you may be reading out of different uh, uh, texts. Um, but if they do not follow along with, I believe, which is a, a superior text, it's King James. And then the NASB, I, I really like that, the way it words. And it follows along with the King James. It just words things a little bit differently. Uh, so I invite you to explore the scriptures and not restrict your mind. If you have problems stumbling in certain areas of your life uh, or certain understandings of scripture, Sometimes you go to a different uh, text and, uh, um, or a different Bible, I should say, and it will, it'll have a different, it'll have the understanding placed differently. In other words, the words will be correct. It will be the same meaning, but it'll be words that you can grab hold of and understand. That's what I'm trying to say. And sometimes that helps you with your understanding. And so to everyone who says King James and King James only, amen, okay? Uh, most, I have King James Bibles. I have, you know, I have like 40 Bibles. So, you know, I go through texts and I look and, and I compare. And it's like when you go on your computer or, or on your phone, you get Bible Hub. You know, sometimes you go to the Bible Hub and it'll help you see something in the text that you, you didn't see before. And then you recognize that that is the truth. It's not, it hasn't been changed. Just the different wording of it reveals it in a way that you have understanding. And I think that God provides that for us. Now, there are a lot of Bibles out there. I'm not, I'm not trying to, to sell any particular Bibles. There's a lot of Bibles out there that are, have, have removed certain scriptures. And I think that's wrong. Um, there are people who, who have done all kinds of things that I think is wrong. And you have to be wise when you study. You have to recognize the truth. You know, once again, I believe that King James is a good foundational uh, direction to go from. Um, sometimes the wording is a little hard for some people to understand. So therefore, you have the new King James, you know, which the words are a little bit different and people grab hold of understanding. It's a good, you know, and you have a King James study word uh, Bible, um, that's a good Bible to where in which you can, you, it's worded differently than the, than the old English. If you want to go back and get the old English style, um, there are Bibles out there that predate the King James. Oh my God, some people could have a heart attack right now because there are Bibles out there that predate, you know, and the, the English version of it is so much different, so much different. But yet, when you read it and you study the words that are different to you, you will find out that the King James, that they line up together. Amen? So I just want to encourage you to broaden your, 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 your studies, okay? Don't be afraid to pick up another Bible, but I would say always come back to the King James, you know, but compare. And I, I don't know why I'm saying all this right now, maybe to cut time out, I don't know. But I think that God's trying to speak. He says, you know, my people perish for the lack of knowledge or wisdom or understanding. You know, and, and so we have to get understanding. In all your ways, the Bible says, get, get understanding. All right? So whatever it takes for you to get there, to understand what God is speaking, may I encourage you to make sure that that's what you do. To seek after him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. And then all these things should be added unto you. All the wisdom and knowledge and understanding you need. All the provisions that you need in him. Because he loves us. He loves us. And so because he loved us, he redeemed us. He, he made a pathway for us to come to him. So let's start reading here um, in, in King James or in uh, NASB. But now, thus says the Lord your creator, O Jacob, who he and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. 
I have called you by name. You are mine. The depth of this scripture right here is so profound that we could spend an hour just on this scripture right here. He formed us from the very beginning. He called us into existence. He shaped and molded us and said, this is who Edwin's going to be. This is who Nelson's is going to be. This is who Evelyn's going to be. This is who TJ is going to be. This is who Helen's going to be. I called you forth. I created you. And because there's such chaos around you, uh, as he says, to, he says here, and he formed you, O Israel. Remember that Israel was not a nation at first, okay? It was, a, it was a group of people, almost like nomads. They didn't have a land until he brought them to the land that he had made for them and promised them, okay? But all during that time period, there was a lot of fear going on in people's lives. They had no co connectivity to anything or even to God. They, they, they would go one week or, or one month or one year serving God and, and then they would go on the wayside doing something else and they'd turn to idols and all these kind of things. And then they'd be enslaved. They'd be, I mean, just all kinds of things going on in their lives, okay? And a lot of those things became very fearful for them. They, they didn't know, they had, they had no understanding of a redeemer. They had no understanding of, of, of someone loving them so much that he had formed them and created them to be a peculiar people, a people of purpose, a people of his, his people, okay? And we'll, as we read down here further, it's going to go into great detail into this. It says, I formed you, Israel, do not fear, okay? I brought you together. I have saved you. I have redeemed you, it says. I have called you by name. He has given you a name, Jacob, who once was Jacob is now called Israel. Israel was now a people, a people of promise, a people that was, that was given a, a promise to them that they could have life in God, that if they would just trust and believe in him, that he would be their God. He would lead them. And so many today need that same promise in their heart. They need to understand that we are adopted in. We are adopted into the kingdom. We are his children. He says, I called you by name. He's called us by name. And he says, you are mine. And, you know, and King James says, thou art mine. See the difference there? It's, just, it's, it's the same thing. Thou art mine or you are mine. He said, this and he doesn't lie he's not a man that he should lie what he says he does he performs everything that he does so he's, when he says you are mine he's saying if you will believe in me you'll trust in me don't fear what the world looks like don't fear what they're saying don't look at that ad, that, that aspect i have redeemed you i have called you i have you there's a purpose for me to call you there is a reason why i have called you because you are my people, and I am your God. In Isaiah, don't turn here, but I'm just going to read the scripture. Isaiah 50, uh, 45 and 3. I will give you treasures of darkness and hidden wealth and secret places, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. Very important. To understand that each and every one of you that are watching tonight and those who are still coming to the Lord, God has called you and them by name. When you look at a person around you, when you look at people around you, beware. Do not curse them. Speak blessings into their life because they are your brothers and sisters. They are created in the image and the likeness of God. So therefore, don't curse them, all right, but love them. As Christ called us to love, love our neighbors, okay? To show ourselves friendly, to be a living example of the glorious love and compassion that God has for us, let it be revealed through us that they also may see and hear and feel and come to know the glory of God. We have to make sure that we are walking in the right tone, in the right way. So don't fear what the world is doing. Don't fear what's going on. Be aware of it, but trust in the Lord because he's the one who has redeemed us. He is the one that's called us from darkness. 
He is the one who has made a way out of no way. He is the one who has wiped out all of our transgressions. He is the one who is, is, is like a thick cloud over us. He protects us. He guards us. You know, then your sins are like a heavy weight on you. But if you'll just turn to him, you'll just, just look to him. He will take those sins because why? He has called you by name. He's given you a name. He's given you a purpose and a direction in which you are to walk. Amen? And you belong to him. Hallelujah. Verse 2, when you pass through the waters, this is, the, this is, this, this, this is like a prayer. This, this scripture, the this, this scriptures here are, are kind of like a prayer that we should be praying in this manner that, you know, when we pass through the waters, God, be with us. Every, every, every storm that we go through, all right, I will be, he says, he says, I will be with you. So he tells us when you pass through, that means you're going to go through stuff, okay? You're going to have trials and tribulations, but do not fear. Go back to verse one. Once again, do not fear. Because you can trust the Lord. You can trust that he's with you. You can trust that he's moving with you. That he's walking beside you, in you, and through you. You can believe it. And that there's no weapon formed against you that can prosper. He tells you this in two different ways here. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And though the rivers, okay, and through, through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire... You will not be scorched, nor will the flames burn you. There is no weapon that man has that can do you harm unless you don't trust God, unless you don't believe in who he is. You are going to go through things. Yes, you are going to suffer many things. God told Paul through Ananias, look, go tell Paul he's going to suffer many things. Go tell him, okay? Why? Because Paul understood from the time on the Damascus Road, from that moment, that he was going to have to endure a lot of things. And his choice was to say yes to the Lord. Why? Because he understood he has called me. What did, what did God do to Saul? He changed his name. He gave him a name. So you go back to verse 1. I called you by name, okay? You are no longer Saul, now you are Paul. You are no longer Simon, but now you are Peter. Understand that when God calls you, you he changes your name. He, he gives you a name that he's, he's ordained from the very beginning. I used to go around by the name of Neil. The reason I did that is because people couldn't pronounce it Mellis. I mean, it'd be Mellis and Meals and all, all kinds of all kinds of offsprings from that. So I used to go around just make it easy for everybody to say, ah, I'm, I'm Neil. Okay? But one day God said, wait a minute here. You know, I understood in my in my in my spirit that that was wrong. He gave me the name Nellis. Does it mean anything biblical? I don't know. All I do know is I am precious to him. He created me. He formed me. And because of this, I'm learning and learned not to fear. I'm learning to trust in God. I don't have to have an, another name. I, I have to have a name that he called me by, that he ordained me, that he called me to life, to live. So when Jacob turned to the Lord, what happened? He said, now your name's no longer Jacob. It is now Israel. God ordains us. He calls us forth from the darkness of our lives, from the things that we've been doing that are wrong, incorrect. And what does he do? He shines a light into our hearts and reveals us in him. When we are revealed in him, we have a, a greater understanding of our purpose. Our purpose is to serve him. Our purpose is to love him. Our purpose is to do his will. That's our purpose. Our purpose is to save souls. Those who were once like us, like we were in the past, that we were lost and blind, walking around in fear, trembling in our own mess, you know, wallowing in our own garbage and our own vomit, okay? Returning to it all the time, doing things we used to always do over and over and over again. But God called us out. When he called us out, he cleaned us up. 
He took it. He took away all the filth that was inside of me. He took away all the, the hatred and anger that was inside of me. I used to be a very angry person. He took all that away. And what did he do? He gave me a new heart. He took that hardened heart and he gave me a new heart upon which now I love and I walk in peace. I can still get angry, but the Bible tells me to be angry and sin not. So I can still be angry at things. I, can, I still hate, I hate sin where I, where I used to love sin. Now I hate sin. I find it an abomination. I can't see why people don't understand that there's only there's male and female. Why do you think there's 94 different? No, there's not. There's only male and female. Okay? God created us male and female. He didn't create us these and thems and thous and, and all of that kind of stuff. Days and, you know, all these adjectives and verbs are trying to put in there to make themselves feel important. You're not important, by the way. I'm sorry to say that. You are not important except unto God. When you turn to him, you find your purpose. When you find your purpose, you see how important you are to God, how he designed you for a reason, for this calling right now, for today. But just turn to him. Turn to him and let him lead you in the path of righteousness, and you will have life eternal. Life eternal doesn't mean that everything's going to be okay, because it tells you right here once again in verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And though the rivers, and through the rivers, okay, they will not overflow you. Nothing is going to overtake you. You are not going to be drowned. Sometimes it's going to feel like you're almost there. But if you're calling upon Jesus, guess what? He'll, hand, he'll give you a helping hand up. He will help you out. I have an example of that in the Bible. Peter saw Jesus walking on the water. What does he do? He bid Jesus to come, for him to come. And Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water. But when the waves and the wind started bolstering around, when things started happening, what did Peter do? He took his eyes off from Jesus. When he took his eyes off from Jesus, he started drowning. But Jesus, when Peter called out, when Jesus reached out his hand and pulled him up and they walked back to the boat on the water. Now I want you to think about this. God will not let you drown if you are calling on him. He will not let, leave you the wasteland if you'll trust in him. He will, let, he will lift you up. He will place your feet on holy ground. He will give you life and make sure that your life is fulfilled in him. So, and though the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched. This is very simple, very clear, clear to me. When I walk through the fire, when the, when, when the Hebrew boys were challenged, amen, when the Hebrew boys were challenged, okay, they walked through the fire. They, they chose that they were going to serve God. They did not turn away from God. They decided that God was more important than the king that was trying to direct them to lead them down a wrong path. So they said, even if God doesn't save us from this fire, we're going to serve him. We're going to look to him for our answers. We're going to trust him. You know, and so we have to, we have to make sure that when we, when we walk through the fire of life, and there's fires in life, pain, uh, people abusing and misusing you, governments going crazy and wrong, uh, people being murdered around you, uh, pestilence, I mean, all kinds, of, all kinds of things going on. All of these things, there's always something going on. And if you sit there and you look at them, guess what happens? You take your eyes off from God. And when you take your eyes off from God, guess what happens? You drown in the mess. Yep, when you let the worry and the anger and the anguish take over and you become anxious, you know, you just, you, just, you just lose it. Because why? You're not focusing on what really matters. The thing that really matters in our life is God. The thing that really matters is our relationship with him. And here in Isaiah, he's trying to tell us, look, I'm your redeemer. I am the one that gave you a name. I'm the one that called you out. You are mine. 
and all those that call upon my name shall be saved. All of those who come to me. It's not just that word, all those that call upon my name shall be saved. It's, it's part of calling on his name means that you're going to follow and believe and trust and, and obey. Okay? There's, there's a lot connected to all of those that call upon his name. Okay? There is a, there is a process within calling upon his name that is to trust, live, and obey. Okay? That is to seek after, to not look to other gods, to keep focused on him, knowing that he's able once again to bring you out from all the mess that you've been in. And you thank him for it, you give him praise for it daily. And anything that you do wrong that you don't know or do know, just repent. Just say, look at Lord, I don't know what's going on, Father, but I'm sorry. I need you. I need you to guide me. I need you to strengthen me. I need you to lead me. I need to get past this, whatever whatever trial and temptation I'm in. Father God, I'm just going to trust in you. Verse 3 here says, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt for a ransom, Cush and Sheba in your place. In other words, those who will not serve him are paying the penalty and a price for not serving him. Because the penalty that was due for, for Minister Edwin and for myself was paid by Christ, our Redeemer. It was paid by him. So the other people that choose not to follow God, that choose not to listen to him, what happens to them? There's a penalty that they have to pay. And they will pay, they will pay it in Shiloh. They'll pay it in hell. They will be in a place where they cannot survive. They cannot overcome because they're not willing to turn to God and listen to what God is speaking. So it says here in verse 3, once again, I'm going to read verse 3 and we'll jump down to verse 4. For I am, <laughs> that right there is so powerful. That, that knocked many on their tails. That knocked many down. That, can you turn the light on? That, that really, outside. Outside. Yes, thank you. Okay, my wife just got back and picked up my granddaughter. Amen. Tell her to join us. Ask her to join us. I did say she's 20. Yeah, ask her. She knows she's in the house. Amen. All right. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt for a ransom, Cush and Sheba, in your place. Since you are precious, okay? Since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored, I and I love you. I will give other men in your place, other peoples, in exchange for your life. There are, we are all guilty. Okay? We are, we are all guilty. But being guilty, we are also called by his name, or he's given us a name, Israel. We are adopted into the, the tribe of Israel. We are adopted into the kingdom. You know, we, we, we have been grafted. And because we are grafted, then we find that, that we have an opportunity to walk with him where others who refuse to, once again, don't have that opportunity. And they pay their own penalty because of their own decisions. It is their decisions that do it. Amen? I will give others in your place and other people in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring you, will bring your offspring from the east and gather them from the west. I will say to the north, Give them up and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. For in Isaiah 43, and we're at verse 7 right now. Your hand. Uthi. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. Isaiah what? Isaiah 43, we're at verse 7 right now. Everyone who is called, okay, everyone who is called by my name, okay, everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. Now, there's a dynamic here that I really want to uh, touch on real quick here. First of all, I am called of God. You are called of God, right? We are, we are called of the Lord. We are called by his name. Oh, Lord Jesus. I just lost my place here. Hold on. <laughs> Amen. One moment. Hmm. There we go. Now we're back there. Touch the wrong button. All right. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. Is there a difference between being formed and being made? Question. Is there a difference between being formed and being made? Um, yes. So I think with being formed and being made, I think like being made is like, uh, I don't know, I'm thinking of it like as like pottery or something, like you just like make something, you know, like you're making the clay, but then like being formed is like, like the I don't know, the potter or the person with the hands is like actually forming it and turning it into something. Okay. I was just thinking something like that. Because <laughs> I was thinking in Genesis, he says, let us make man in our image. So he's talking about making, but that's making us, but the action, what forming is, is doing the actual action. Mm -hmm. It's actually doing the thinking. It's, it, it's forming it, shaping it, molding it. In Genesis 2, 27, God says, I'll make man in my image, okay? 2, 26, we'll make, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And then he goes on to say that he'll make it in, in ours. So he created us. But then the process from sin <coughs> to righteousness is being us being formed. Being actually molded. Okay. So you're both correct. Okay. In that. Because when you're being formed, what does a person that does pottery, if you know anything about making pottery, when a person's making pottery, um, what do they do? It turns on a wheel, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And they're shaping it. They're forming it. But every so often you see them throw some stuff away. They're taking the stuff that's no good, that's imperfection, of what they don't want in, in their in the clay and they're getting rid of it. So when he talks about us forming forming us, that's exactly what he's doing. He's taking away all those in, impurities mm -hmm. that were so easy to hold on to, yes. Also the potter is pour, putting part of their personality into they're putting their love, mean. yes. Correct. Right. Yep. That's why it says formed in his image. That were created in his in his image for his pleasure. Because we're we're created for his pleasure. So, you know, he's molding us the way he wants us to be. So he's putting his character, he's taking away our deformed, sinful character and forming his character in, inside of us. In Ephesians 2.10, we're not going to turn there, I'm just going to read because we're just saving time here. Ephesians 
2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ, in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Okay? We cannot walk in the glory and the power of God if, he, if we don't allow him to form us. We can only be an imitator. So there are those out there who have a form, the Bible says, has a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. The forming, the form of is that yeah, they look like, they act like, but they have no understanding of the power that is given to them through Christ Jesus. They deny that power as being uh, uh, valid in their life. So they go ahead and they, and they do church. They do everything according to their will and not his will. When you are formed on the, on the clay, when, the, when, the, when we are the who are the clay are formed, we are formed to do his will, not our own. That's why the impurities have to be taken out. That's why you can't just trust every person and say, oh, I'm a Christian. You have to see them. You know them by their works. You know them by detesting their spirit. Okay? It's easy to come in and be deceived by all those people who say, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. I'm a Christian, but I don't fellowship other people. I'm a Christian, but, you know, I'm a Christian, but, you know, I'm a Christian, but, you know. Every time you use the word but in the, in the conversation, you're changing the direction of the conversation. You're changing the very meaning of it. So all these people are always putting the word but in there, you know. Well, I, I believe in God, but, you know, I, I need to do my own thing. I believe, you know, I believe in God, but, okay. There is, there is one thing that really bothers me about today's people. And I point at myself because I'm imperfect, okay? Is that we think we can get away with just praise in the church or outside of the church, singing a few songs here and there and think that everything's okay, all right? But we, the Bible says in, in, in Psalms, okay, enter into his courts with thanksgiving and into his presence with praise, all right? But beyond praise is worship. You see, you can praise on the outside and sound good and feel good about it. You can put on an imitation of who you say you are in Christ. But only when you get into worship do you get into his presence. You'll never, ever get into his presence. You'll, you can touch the outside edge. Like I can touch the outside edge of this computer right here. Okay? But I can't get into it unless I come into a place in my heart of worship. A place of Connecting myself to it. Now, I use the computer as kind of a poor analogy, but if I don't connect myself, my hands, my fingers don't type in, okay, I'm not going to get anything out of it because it's going to just sit there. It's never going to change. So I can say that I'm a Christian. I can say that I believe in God. But if there's no action, then there's no faith. Faith is an action word. So we walk by faith and not by sight. That means that in our direction, every step that we take, he orders our footsteps. As he orders our footsteps, there is a way that we, that we ought to go. There is a direction that we need to do. And we can only do that if we are hearing from him. So in our prayer life, it's not just about what we want. It's about what he wants. Because what we want is really always about the flesh until we surrender ourselves to his will. Then it becomes about his will working in our life. But up until then, now it's about our flesh. Well, I want this. I want that. I want this car. I want that person. I want, I want this money. I want that job. I want, I want, I want, I want. No, the thing is, God, what do you want from me? Well, how do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Well, who do you want me to be? Okay, you want me to be a missionary? I'm going to be like Bishop, Bishop Bob. I'm going to travel the world, as he tells me. You want me to do mission work here at home and, and, and reach out to people? I'm going to do that. You want me to preach the gospel? Yes, I'm going to preach the gospel. What does that look like? We have to ask God, what does it look like? Because what he's calling us to do is never what we want to do. It's true. 
Because if we do what we want to do, we're not doing God's will. We're just doing what we want to do and saying it and do it in the name of Jesus. We're just doing it in vain. I'm not trying to be hard on anybody, but I'm trying to tell you the truth. God called you. He placed a name in you. He called you. He, he, you, are, you are his. You belong to him. But you don't act like it. You don't act like it. You want to go off and do your own thing. I know it's easy. It's just me. I know he knows my heart. No, yeah, yeah, he does know your heart. And guess what the Bible says about being heart? What does the Bible say about the heart? Deceiving a bunch of small others. That's the most deception thing. It's wicked. Wicked and deceitful. What are we it's doing? wicked, okay? Oh, All right, why? Because it wants what it wants. It wants something that's contrary to God. Oh, but well, I gotta have this. It's mine. I gotta have it. Wait a minute. Did God give it to you? Did God assign it to you? Did God tell you to go get it? Well, you know, no, I want it. That's not the issue. The issue is that you've got to die to yourself. When you die to yourself, you open yourself up to God. You open yourself up to his will being done in your life. This is a hard thing for us to understand because we want. We want. But it doesn't matter what we want. He created us. He's the Father. He's the one that's called us for a purpose. He's the one that's called us for a reason. He gave, He offers us life and life more abundantly in Him, not in the world. In Him. We are a witness to God. Mm. Lord Jesus. Verse 8. Bring out the people. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you, Jesus. See, God, God just puts things together. Bring out the people who are blind, even though they have eyes, and the deaf, even though they have ears. Look at what God is saying to us. Just because you have ears, just because you have eyes, you're not paying attention. You're not focused on me. You're focused on you. So you're blinded to the direction you need to go in. You're blinded to the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but by me, but through me. Okay? <laughs> Bring out the people who are blind. We are to be soul winners. We are to be representatives, ambassadors to the kingdom of God. An ambassador only does what God wills. He only speaks what God says. What happens is that we want. You don't understand. Yeah, I do understand. You don't think. You know, I was telling a person today, I said, you got to remember that grandma will always love you. Always. But as you grow older, there's going to be time when you don't want to come to our house. You don't want to do X, Y, and Z. You, you know, you'd rather go do what you want to do. And I get it. I've been there and done that. We had a good conversation about it. I've been there and done that. I didn't want to go to my grandma's house. The only time I go there is I go there and fish. Okay? I didn't want to go there because there was nothing to do. I was bored. Why? Because they were old and I wasn't. I had so much energy and they sat around and did very little. They worked hard at what they were doing at their age, but that was it. Grandma loved to cook, you know, but I didn't want to go there. The issue with us is that we're like all like little babes, okay, in our lives. We don't want to listen to the Father. We don't want to do what he wants. Why? Because he's given us this, this wonderful life and he's given us free will to choose. He's, he's given us an open door saying, look, you know what? He's asking, choose me. He's got his hands out. Choose me. I love you. I created you. And then we want to go do what we want to do, how we want to do it. Thinking that's going to be okay. But I always have to say this to everyone. No one's promised tomorrow. We don't know it's going to be okay. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to put fear upon you. I'm trying to get you to think because 
Here we are, bring out the people who are blind. You are blinded to the truth of who God is. You are blinded to the possibilities of where you might go, believing it's going to be okay. There's a story going around, if I may tell the story real quick here. There's a story going around about a rich man who uh, goes up to heaven. And, you know, he, he's a politician, actually. He goes up to heaven. And Peter meets him at the gate. The anger meets him there at the gate and says to him, okay, so we give you a choice. You can either choose heaven or you can choose hell. So he spent a day in heaven. And then he was okay, you know. He kind of, he kind of, kind of caught it like a little boring and stuff like that, right? You know, it was, you know, just like, okay, you know, I'm here. So the next day he went down to hell and they sent him in hell and wow, there was golf courses there, swimming, all right, all this kind of stuff, all right, going on. And man, this is like exciting, just, you know, it's like, you know, back home, okay, this is cool, right? So he goes back up and, and the angel at the gate, they ask him, you know, what, what, do you, what, what do you choose? And he goes, well, you know, Hell wasn't bad at all. I'm, I'm going to choose hell. Okay? So he went back down to hell, and what happened? He gets to hell, and he sees people screaming in the lake of fire. They're going through all kinds of mess, all kinds of things. You know? And you know, then he turns around, and the devil's standing there in the, in the suit and tie, and everything else is, is, is crazy. You know, chaotic, upside down. And, and he goes, I understand. I was here yesterday. You know, and now look at it, it's not the same. He goes, well, yeah, yesterday we were campaigning. <laughs> okay? Hell is not what you think it's going to be, because it's going to be a lot worse. All right? And if you take it for granted right now, you're going to find that, find that out. I believe that with all my heart, and I don't want to go there. I pray that I can do everything that God has called me to do to fulfill his will We're operating in my life, but I'm not going to go there because, yeah, when God, when, when the devil's campaigning, he's showing you all the good little things. Oh, you can have the money, you can have this, you can do that, you can do all this kind of stuff. But when it comes down to it, when you get there, it's nothing like it. It's been the lie, it's been told to you all your life. Okay? You've been blinded to the truth. Isaiah 6, 9 says, okay, go, he said, go and tell this people. Keep listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Go and tell them. Look, you got to start listening. You got to start paying attention. Six nine. Yep, Isaiah six nine. He said, "Go and tell this people," and I'm here to proclaim to you today to tell you. Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking. But do not understand. If you do that, you're going to be lost. Seek understanding. He who is blind, but my servant. Everyone is blind, but God's servant. You got to serve God. Don't take for granted this life that you've been given. Don't assume anything unless God tells you. That is so important. That is so, so important. So bring out the people who are blind, even those who have eyes. You see, but you do not understand. You do not grasp the reality, All right? The deaf, who even still have ears, but they can't hear. Why? Because they close themselves off to the truth. They do not want to hear the truth because it's contrary to what they want. They want what they want. And the heart is wicked. All the nations have gathered together so that people may be assembled who among them can declare this and proclaim to us the former things. Let them present their witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and say it is true. Israel served God and there was times they did not. There were times that they gave their testimony and then times that they didn't. We must stay focused 
we must be fastened in reality, okay? The reality of who Christ is and his word. Verse 10 says, you are my witnesses, declared the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there is no God formed, and there will be none after me. I, even I am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. God declares his sovereignty. He declares who he is. He tells us from the very beginning that he is the one that formed us. He is the one who made us. He is the one who created us. He is the one who gave us a name. He is our God, and we are his people. He tells us over and over again, do not fear. And I think what he says really in do not fear is come to know me and you won't have, anything. You won't have to fear. You won't have to worry. You won't have anxieties. Oh, you're going to have trials and tribulations, but if you keep focusing on me, you're going to have joy. This joy will surpass your understanding because it's not a joy of the flesh. It's a joy in your spirit. It's a contentment knowing that I am able, that I bring you through, that I'm walking with you, that I am your God. I, even I am the Lord, and there is no other Savior besides me. You can call any kind of gods you want, and they cannot save you. No, not one because they're not real. It was I who have declared and saved and proclaimed, and there was no stranger, strange God among you. There was a time when you first came to me that you had no other God. You put away everything, but gradually what you have done is you have fallen away. You have made cars and people and items, your idols, and your gods. Put those strange gods away. Become my witness again. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. I am your God. I am the Lord. I am your Lord. And there is no Savior besides me. Verse 12 goes on to say, So you are my witnesses declares the Lord, and I am your God. I am. What are you reading from? Isaiah 43. Okay. Verse 13 says, Even from eternity, I am he, and there is none who can deliver me out of my hand. I act and who can reverse it? There's no one that can change. When God opens a door, no one can close that door but God. When God closes the door, no one can open that door. All right? So even from eternity, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. He can, no one can pluck you out of the hand of God. You have a will, a free will, to make choices. And those choices can have you walk away from God. That's your own choice. But I cannot cause Minister Edwin to leave God. No one. Or Ruthie to leave God. Or Evelyn to leave God. Or David or, or TJ or Helen. Any, any numerous people. I cannot cause any of them. Because... God gave you free will. He gave you the ability to choose and to choose this day in whom you're going to serve. Each and every day is a choice that we must make. In making that choice, all right, is how we follow God. Are you willing to put down the things that, that would take you away from, distract you from, that, would, you, would, that you would create to being in another God or, or a strange God, uh, uh, strange to you, strange to me, strange to everyone else, idols, all this kind of stuff. Are you willing to put all that stuff away and turn to God? Are you willing to have your eyes open? 
Are you willing to hear with the ears that God gave you? Are you able to understand with the heart that God has put inside of you? Can you learn to love and trust in him? This is your opportunity today to do exactly that. It's your opportunity to hear what thus saith the Lord. Okay? To see and witness the glory of God. Today is the day of salvation. Today. Tomorrow may not come. The devil is always going to tell you there's always a tomorrow. But I'm here to, t to tell you, declare and decree that we do not know if there will be a tomorrow. We do not know. We have a brother that's in the hospital right now. We don't know his condition. We know very little about it. Supposedly he has a heart problem. We don't know at his age or anyone's age if there's a tomorrow. We don't know. We don't know if I'm going to wake up in the morning. I would like to hope to think so. But if I don't, I pray that I'm doing what God has called me to do up until the very moment that he calls me home. I'm going to read one more verse here. Verse 14. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake, I have sent to Babylon, and I will bring them all down as fugitives, even the Chaldeans, unto the ships in which they rejoice. And final verse, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I hope that uh, uh, you've got something out of this teaching today. Um, I know I didn't open up the platform to speak too much, but God has had me going and I give God all of the glory. He is our you know, he, he's our maker. He's our creator. There is nothing that's made that wasn't made by him. And we can rejoice in knowing that he is God and God all by himself. He doesn't take counsel of any other God. He doesn't counsel with one, two, three, or four, or five other so-called deities or anything like that. He is God. He makes the final decision. He is the decision. And when he speaks, even E.F. Hudson has to listen. <laughs> Okay, and I ask that you all just listen to what the word says, to what God says. Uh, this word isn't for me, it's from God, and you are his. You've been called. He's given you a name, you know, and my granddaughter here, Ruth, Ruthie, has a very powerful name in, in the Bible. Sometimes we'll sit and talk about how powerful the name of Ruthie is. Okay. Because it's very important that we understand that God has given to us his power. Because he's given to us his love. And he's given to us his spirit. All right? So amen. I'm not, I just, I'll keep on going if I, if I start it up again. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word, Father God. I thank you for this time, Father. I thank you. That you loved us so much, Father God, that you formed us before the foundation of the world. That you knew us before then, Father God. We are older than dirt, Father God, because you knew us before the dirt was formed. And Father, we are the clay and you are the potter. Father, we just ask that you will mold us and shape us into your likeness even more, Father God, that you will... Remove the impurities, Father God, that you reveal our real sinful nature, things that we're holding on to, and we don't even maybe maybe not even know we're holding on to them, or or our, our misgiving of our, our own thinking, our own will that is contrary to your will operating in our life, Father God. Whatever it may be, Father, just reveal yourself, Father God. We ask in Jesus' name, we ask that you Open the windows of heaven, Father God, and pour out blessings upon all those who have an ear to hear, Father God, and eyes to see. Father, not, don't let us be just, just 
people of uh, don't let us be people that wander without faith, Father God. Let us, but let us be people who walk by faith, Father God, that we may be found pleasing, that we may walk uprightly, Father God, that we may lead others in the path of righteousness as we are led. Father, this day we give to you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, Father God. And we pray, Father God, for our loved ones, Father God, both near and far, Father God. We pray for those who you have placed on our hearts, Father God, and our mind, Father God. We pray that they walk rightly before you, Father God, always giving you praise and glory, Father God. Let us not look to ourselves for answers, Father God, but let us look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. That as we walk, Father God, we become that light that shines in, sharp, in darkness, Father God. And even though the darkness does not comprehend it, Father God, there are those in the midst of that darkness, Father God, who are looking, who are seeking, who are crying out, even in this hour, Father God. And let us be the servants that go to them, Father God, and offer them your truth, Father God, the truth, the only truth, Father God. And to you we give all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. amen. All right. Um, you can pray for David. Yes. 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 Amen.